welcome to State Lobbying Heroes Podcast, a podcast where we delve into the careers and personal life stories of some of the best and the brightest state government relations experts. I'm your host, Deepak, CEO of Legistracker. I had the privilege and honor to sit with the former mayor of Columbia City of South Carolina, Mayor Bob Cole. Bob started his career as an attorney but was always interested in politics. This passion led him to become the mayor and eventually now a lobbyist. Let's learn about his journey in this show. Hi, Bob. Thank you so much for joining me for this podcast. It's really a big honor for me to have you on the show. Thank you. Look forward to it. All right. Thank you. So let's get started. So were you born in South Carolina and were you in South Carolina all your life? I was. I was born in uh, Conway, South Carolina, 1953, which uh, for you young folks, I'm sure is uh, they hadn't invented electricity back then, I don't believe. My father was a superintendent of schools. My mother uh, took care of the family and we moved to Columbia when I was um, four years old. Oh, wow. Oh, I see. Were, how many siblings did you have? I have a, a, an older sister who has passed away and an older brother who teaches uh, Chinese history at the University of uh, Nebraska. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Very nice. And how was your childhood? I mean, were you a lot into academics or what was it like? It was just sort of a regular South Carolina kid growing up, went to public schools, of course. Uh, my extracurricular activity uh, in high school was the debate team. Franny Heiser, who was a uh, an attorney with the Burr firm, the former McNair firm here in Columbia, throughout South Carolina. She and I were debate partners. So she was uh, on Columbia City Council for a number of years and enjoyed, uh, that was at Dreher High School. Certainly enjoyed that and uh, went on to the University of South Carolina. Oh, very nice. So, so back when you were in the school, did you always think that you were always interested in like civics and politics and all of that stuff? How did you actually grow interest in it? Well, I really was. I uh, was always interested in that. You know, the debate team was something that fostered an interest uh, in going to law school. And I was the uh, student body president at Dreher High School in my senior year. So politics and running for office was always something I was interested in and enjoyed doing. Back then in uh, 1970-71, when I was a senior, was the beginning when the schools were integrated in a affirmative manner. So we uh, spent a lot of time uh, working with uh, other schools that their students would be coming to our school and some of our students theirs. So there was a, a lot of work to do during the summer to prepare for that, uh, to make sure it went successfully. And like after your high school, what made you, did you try and look for other colleges other than USC or was, was that the only college you had your eyes set on? No, Carolina was where, where I wanted to go. Got a debate scholarship to go back then. A $250 scholarship would pay half your tuition. Wow. Now that wouldn't even pay a bar tab uh, down at five points uh, for <laughs> out of folks. And uh, uh, so Carolina was where I always wanted to go and was very familiar with that. My father had passed away and my mother moved back to her hometown of Chesterfield, South Carolina. So got became familiar with Clemson because a lot of folks there had gone to Clemson because of the agricultural connection. But uh, Carolina was just never thought of any place else other than uh, USC. I see. Interesting. And you were an attorney there, right? I mean, you, you took the law. Is that right? At USC College? Went to USC Law School after graduating from Carolina mm -hmm. and then uh, became a lawyer. Uh, when I passed the bar. And just to, just so that I understand, in order to become a lobbyist, do you need to learn the law or it does not, is that not a re prerequisite? No, no, you don't have to be a lawyer to be a lobbyist. I think the lobbyist, of course, because we deal with enacting law, need a familiarity with how lobbying works. But most, uh, most uh, lobbyists come from a background, many cases of having worked at the legislature and having a familiarity with how the system works, how laws are made, how committees and how things uh, occur. So, but you certainly don't need to be a lawyer to be a lobbyist. I don't think just as in the legislature, some 10, 15, 20% of the legislature are attorneys. So it's not a prerequisite. And in fact, I think uh, 
a diversity of backgrounds and experiences help that common sense approach to lobbying and certainly being a legislator. And now if you if you look back, would you say that learning the law was hand, was handy to you, but now that you're a lobbyist? I think it's uh, helpful, certainly as a law firm. Uh, Nexon Pruitt is a law, large law firm, a multi-state. Uh, you have a number of clients that are legal clients that uh, tend to have legislative issues, and uh, usually those involve drafting legislation or understanding legislation. So that part of it is helpful. When you're an attorney, I think you can use that experience and background to understand and help draft legislation. So it certainly helped, but so many of my colleagues are not uh, uh, lawyers. I, I would never say that they or anything other than outstanding lobbyists. And what was your favorite course in the entire, when you were at the USC college, what was your favorite course in all? An undergraduate, it was certainly history. I enjoyed that. I um, enjoyed uh, the history of uh, World War II in particular. I remember one course. And uh, in law school, I think uh, it was torts, which is when you sue people for injury, negligence, that type of things. Okay. And was there like a, a major? I mean, in, when you were there, did you pick any specific line in law? Uh, not in law. In undergraduate, of course, it was government and international studies. Ghent, as they called it then, I don't know if that still exists. But uh, in law school, you didn't have a major like you did in undergraduate. Some uh, lawyers went on to get a tax degree, and that would be a specialty. And when lawyers are practicing in a particular area, they can be certified as a specialty but uh, not uh, a major, so to speak, in law school. Interesting. So after USC college, then you went to JD Law, right? And that was in USC college too, as well? Yes, it's uh, law school, uh, it's three years. And after you finished your, then of course, four years of uh, undergraduate. Okay, that's where you did the government and international studies in JD Law. Correct. And is there like a, after you finish the JD Law, do you need to like pass any exam or something like that? You do. Once you have graduated and passed all the exams to graduate from uh, law school, you have to take the South Carolina bar or whatever state you're in, uh, the bar exam. It's a little different now. It's more of a national test, but then it was both national legal issues as well as South Carolina specific issues. And it was a three-day test. Back then, it's a two-day test now, and uh, you have to pass that before you can become an attorney in South Carolina. I see. Interesting. So I know like USC, what is the major sport there? Is it like baseball or is it basketball or what is it? Well, I think it uh, certainly is becoming uh, women's uh, basketball. That's a a favorite uh, simply because they're doing so well. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think over the years, you'd have to say that football, obviously, is always going to be, I guess, the uh, top sport in terms of interest and people's being watching what's going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Men's basketball and women's basketball, I think, are certainly important. And, and of course, we've had a lot of success in um, men's baseball. And the day I uh, retired did not run the last term, and Mayor Benjamin uh, was elected the men um, won the, their first national championship. And then the next day, uh, or, or maybe the day after that, I, um, uh, of course, turned the reins over to Mayor Benjamin. And I remember telling him it was still when I was mayor that they had the, uh, the downtown parade. I said, uh, Mayor, why don't you handle that one? You, uh, you're the incoming mayor. So he's a, he was a Carolina, is a Carolina graduate and a former president of the University of South Carolina. So he's oh, a big game cock fan. Oh, very cool. And you have a favorite sport? No, I love football. I think uh, certainly have to do that. Uh, Carolina under uh, Coach Spurrier had some great years. Uh, We hope to get back there with Coach uh, Muschamp, but certainly enjoy that and certainly enjoy women's basketball. The uh, our famed uh, uh, superstar player, she uh, her grandfather was a minister here in Columbia and father Roscoe uh, named after Reverend uh, Roscoe, well, he is a lobbyist, uh, or I don't know if he's registered. He comes down to the legislature a lot, so see him a great deal. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah, I was a lot into NBA before. I was I was in Ohio for about like 10 years, and then I was a lot into NBA, and back then, LeBron James was there, 
And then once he left Cleveland, I said like, okay, I'm done with Cleveland. <laughs> so I just moved on to North Carolina at that point. I understand. Um, <laughs> and so after the J Law, I looked at your bio. Then the next thing on your list was you were a member of the Richland County Council, but there was like a gap of eight years. Can you tell us like what happened in that hiatus? Well, um, when graduated from law school and uh, became a, an attorney in uh, 1978, um, I began practicing law. Franny Heiser and I opened up a law firm. Mm -hmm. And then I ran for the Richland County Council mm -hmm. in uh, really uh, 1984, but lost the election and then ran and won in a special election in 1985. So I was practicing law. Beth, my wife, uh, she and I have uh, six children and I had a number of them between 78 and uh, okay. 1985. Okay, that explains it. You don't have to explain anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. And when you say you had to like run for being a Richland County Council member, can you tell us like what all has to happen? Like when you have to run for it, do you need to... Do you need to find people who can actually support you? I mean, is it like the common public or is it someone else? No, no it's just every registered voter. Back then, uh, Richland County Council, you ran at large. So you had to run first in the party primary. And I was a, uh, a Democrat. So you had to get the Democratic or if you ran in the Republican, the Republican primary nomination. Coming up on June 6 is the primary for both parties this year. And of course, countywide meant you had to go from Shandon to Lower Richland to Eastover, all the way up to St. Andrews and Blythewood and everywhere in between. So it was a lot of territory to cover. Uh, and basically, you just had to, you know, get the most votes of registered voters who went to the polls or voted absentee. So it was just a lot of hard work, a lot of what they call shoe leather, just walking around and talking to people. When I ran for mayor, in 1990, it was a non, what they call a nonpartisan race. So you didn't have a primary, you just ran. And with all uh, races, um, not every race, but in almost all races in South Carolina, you have to get a majority. So if you don't win a majority of the votes the first time, you have a runoff with the top two. So can you like explain like, so once you ran for being a member, you won in 1985, what were the jobs and duties of being a member? I mean, what can you explain on a day-to-day -day basis? What are all the issues you are trying to solve? County Council, uh, then as now, it was responsible for funding the uh, school district. So we funded uh, school district one and school district two. So that was a major part. Then the county was responsible for providing services in what is called the unincorporated area, which basically was outside the city of Columbia. So you had a host of services you had to provide, uh, garbage service, uh, the basic services that are required. The city of Columbia provided water and sewer to most of the county, uh, but there were some pockets where we had to do that. Road maintenance, a lot of dirt roads that had to be maintained, things of that nature. So it was a full load. We met every week and there were 11 members of then the Richland County Council as they are now. Now that they're elected in single member district, so you have a smaller area you have to keep up. So did you know back then, like after you were an attorney, was, did you know that you wanted to run for the mayor, but that's why you had to run for being a member of the Richmond County Council or did it happen that way? No, I ran for the Richmond County Council just because I had been interested in uh, politics. I had been the chairman of the Richmond County Democratic Party and had gotten to know people throughout county. I found that I liked uh, local government. So running for mayor was uh, a uh, sort of a natural step. I see. So what you were there as a member of Richland County Council for three years. Is that the, the term you actually have to serve? That's right. It's a four-year term. And I ran in a special election because one of the folks who had gotten elected passed away. So I was filling an unexpired term. So after the three years at the members of Richland County Council, that's when you decided, okay, I want to run for being a mayor. Well, that was 1988, and uh, they went through court agreement to the single member district. And you didn't have all the single member districts come up at the same. So mine did not uh, come up for in 1988, but came up in 1990. And in the interim, I decided to run for mayor. Okay. Can you like walk us through a process of how is running for a mayor 
different than running for like the member of a county council? Is it is the process different? Is the the work behind it is it different? Yeah, I think everything is really different. Uh, first, uh, you're not running uh, then as a, a group; you're running a, as an individual. And I think people pay more attention to what I'd call the executive, whether it's mayor, governor, or whatever. So you have to have a more specific platform. You have to really be able to articulate what you want to do. I ran on a neighborhood-based um, platform of fighting crime and looking after neighborhood issues. The city of Columbia geographically is smaller, obviously, than Richland County. So you have less to travel, but still a lot of diverse neighborhoods. Columbia is a very diverse city, both uh, geographically, racially, and just the types of neighborhoods there are, different needs in different places. So uh, it was interesting, and I, I certainly enjoyed it. So. So when you said you bought on the basis that you had to like fight crime and that was your main thesis behind that. So were there a lot of other people? How many people were running for, for mayor at that time? Back then there was the incumbent and uh, two others myself. So there were a total of four. Okay. So you went with that and that is how you kind of projected your thesis and that's how you actually got support for yourself and that's how you won it, right? That's right. And was it like a tough competition back then when, when you actually won it? Was it like a straight victory? How was it? No, it was a, we were of course, we were running against a battle on both sides and glad I certainly prevailed, but uh, it was, it, it was a tight race and a hard fought race. Very nice. So now you are a mayor. Can we, I know like you were there for 20 years. So I'm going to see if I'm going to challenge your memory and try and figure out, let's say if you break it down by the term, it's four years, right? Every four years has been. That's so let's start from the beginning, let's say 1990 to 1994. Was there anything which you can recollect in that four year term, which kind of stood out? Like, okay, this was really important for me when I was like running, when I was wor working in the, in that place. And then, you know, what is it that stood out for you? Well, we started, we certainly didn't accomplish it. We uh, started working on having the convention center built, and it had to be a regional effort. It took us until the next term before it, 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 things actually started, but that was one that we worked uh, very hard on, uh, had a, a lot of efforts to uh, go into that. Economic development was something that we started working on in that first term. They formed the Central Carolina Alliance. That's a regional effort to uh, go after industry. Governor McNair helped us go on a number of uh, international trips, primarily to Germany, Italy, to recruit industry. And a lot of uh, that industry is, uh, is here today uh, in uh, the Midlands area. So when, when you actually get into office, they probably will present you with a lot of issues, right? So how do you prioritize them? How do you know like this needs more of my attention than the others? Well, it's, uh, I think that's sort of the role of priority setting of the mayor. Now, the government form of government we have in Colombia is the council manager form of government, which means you really have the same authority as the other council. You know, you're, you have Charleston and North Charleston that have what they call the strong form of mayor or the mayor form of government, where the mayor fills the role of the city manager as well as being mayor. In, in the form of government we have, the city manager is a separate position. So you have to work well with your colleagues if you're going to accomplish much. And did you have to like a lot with other mayors? I mean, did you, was there, is there like collaboration between the mayors? I mean, did you have to meet every often or something like that? Had uh, great relations with other mayors and county council members. Now, Paul Livingston, who is uh, the chairman of the Richland County Council to this day, uh, he and I have ran at about the same time, have worked very closely over the years as uh, other of uh, the chair, chairmen and women of the uh, Richland County Council, a number of mayors throughout the city. Joe Riley, former Mayor Riley, was certainly a mentor of mine, so we had to work very closely with all of them. Now, let's say we fast forward from 1994 to 1998. Do you remember anything again distinctly within that period? So. After the first term, you had to like again stand for elections, right? To get reelected. So That's was right. it hard actually fighting for it? Uh, no, it, the elections seemed to be a little easier. You can't take anything for granted, but they uh, were not as difficult as the first election. By 98, we were uh, working hard on the convention center expansion on the Three Rivers Greenway that uh, has blossomed uh, on the river. A revitalization of 
Main Street with the streetscaping project. All of those, you know, took a long time and were part of what we were trying to do. As the streetscaping, other streetscaping projects of Gervais Street and North Main and uh, Two Notch Road. So when, when, so within the second term, like, how do you, like, I mean, when you get projects, like these projects are pretty long term, right? They last like eight, 10 or 12 years, right? By the time it, from the origination till it actually surfaces and actually get implemented. So how do you convince, like when you actually write the proposal that, okay, this is very important for the city, how do you do that? Well, I think the first thing you do, let's take the example of the convention center. You have to articulate the need and, and benefits of a convention center. And with us, we were able to say that you know, a city of our size, not having a convention center, we we're losing revenue. Then I think you had to articulate that it needed to be a regional between Richland and Lexington County. So you had two county councils you had to work with. The University of South Carolina, the state of South Carolina, all of them were partners we had to work with. Then you had to determine the funding mechanism and you then had to have the location, uh, which was a, a steel mill, the old Owen Steel Mill that we had to buy, work with the University of South Carolina because they put their arena next to the parking lot of the convention center. Probably the best thing I did in all of that was get Bill Duke, who uh, Bill Dukes is the owner of the Blue Marlin restaurant. I believe his son actually runs it now, but he's, he's certainly very active. He uh, had graduated from Dreher High School where I did 10 years earlier before me. I didn't know him and he moved to Chapin. So he was a, a business person who had roots in Columbia, but lived in Lexington County or Chapin, sort of skirts between the two. Certainly new people in Lexington County really could help bring people together. So uh, relied heavily on him, as well as the elected officials using the various funding sources to get the convention center funded. And now prior to the COVID-19 crisis, we, I think we're well on our way to uh, expanding the convention center. And hopefully when all of this is behind us. We can pick that up at the appropriate time and move forward. Very nice. So you are still active in that project? I am, but I'm doing it from an attorney standpoint. We represent some of the parties who have an interest in that, not as a, an elected official. And when you said the funding mechanism, does that all come from the public taxes, city and county taxes? How does that come? Well, they come from taxes that are implemented for tourist-related things. So the funding came from an accommodations tax that is a tax on hotels for visitors uh, that we could put uh, on people who come to the city to visit to help pay for the convention center. And that's the way most convention centers are. So you start uh, from 1990 to 1998. So was the convention center completed by then or what happened in the next phase? It took uh, three terms before the convention center started uh, and 2001 thereabouts. 2002, I believe it was finished in 2004, 2005, somewhere in there. So then 1998 to 2002, what is it that you can remember from that term? We were knee deep in uh, the convention center then. Once you figure out how to build it and construct it, that's, I wouldn't say the easy part. It's getting everybody on the same sheet of music from 98 to 2002. That was the hard part or the hard part. And was there any specifically any challenge? I mean, you can remember during that period or was it just the convention center? Was you completely focused on that? Well, I think two challenges. One is we didn't have a convention center. So a lot of folks said, well, the convention center isn't needed, it won't work. And then you had the regional aspect of it. You're asking Lexington to help fund it and it's going to be located in Columbia. You're helping Richland County to help fund it. Many of those at that point uh, were single member representatives and why would someone in the rural part of Richland County want to do that? So you, but it was an economic boost. Uh, we'd had a similar argument efforts with the new Columbia Museum of Art. Didn't involve Lexington so much, but uh, certainly Richland County. So 2004, 2005 was when it completed? That's right. Uh, okay. So then you are still a mayor. So that would have been a big achievement for you, right? Uh, it was. I, I think it's one of those that... Um, we certainly needed it. If you look at the area now, if you go down to Lincoln Street, you will have people going to a convention, then walking into the Vista, having dinner, going to a basketball game, coming back. I think probably the best example of all of that was the March Madness tournament last year. 
2019, where we hosted uh, the first two rounds of the uh, basketball tournament. And actually, Duke, uh, Coach K, uh, at his closing press conference, got up and uh, sort of sat back down a little bit and said, let me say one more thing. Mm -hmm. And he complimented the region on what a great job we had done. So those are the kind of economic impact experiences for people and their families that you can't have unless you've got the facilities to have. I remember one time I had my kids going to the um, circus at the, then the Carolina Coliseum before Mm -hmm. we had a convention center. Animals and the various things were going by. I remember thinking, well, these kids are just loving it and they have no idea who what elected officials did put this together. Yes. I only had a vague idea. And I remember thinking, that's what happens. You build something, kids and people enjoy it and don't even think about how it got there. But that's that's just the process. Yeah, very true, very true. And I keep, when I take my kids as well to like rally downtown and all, I see like people's names engraved there, how they were like responsible and involved in actually building that stuff. Right. And that actually, kind of tells me like, you know, what kind of effort you guys put in to actually get it in place. Well, you know, right now I would say that if you ask people, do we need a convention center? No one would say anything other than it's been a tremendous success. It's uh, been great. People have gone. They probably either go to the the, uh, Colonial Life Center or if they have family come in, you, you no one is against it now. But back then it, people didn't realize what it could be. So mm-hmm. you, had to, you had to prove, uh, you had to convince them that it was necessary. Yeah, yeah that, that's, I think, the biggest challenge, I bet. You know, how, how do you get all of them aligned on the same paper as you guys are, right? That's right. So, so 2006 to 2010, that was your last term. So back then, then the convention center was done. So what were you doing in the last four years? Well, we had the economic crisis uh, starting in 2008. Oh, yeah. And that, and that really consumed everything. Yeah. And so it uh, had a lot of things we had to do to preserve and protect. So it, uh, but there weren't any big projects after that. Just like today, there won't be any big projects as a result of the COVID-19 until that works itself out. And how did you face that challenge when, you know, probably a lot of jobs would have been lost? Did you have to come up with any innovative ideas to actually... Well, we, we, we certainly tried to help people and keep economic projects alive if we could, but it was challenging. But I think, uh, I, I don't believe it even compares to what we're going through today. I, I would hate to have to be mayor now. I know Mayor Benjamin and city council have been working very hard dealing with a not only a health crisis, but a uh, economic devastation. Hopefully things will open back up. Hopefully the vaccine will be done. But uh, I'm so proud of Mayor Benjamin and the Columbia City Council for the job that they've done, Richland County Council, Lexington County, everyone's done a tremendous job to uh, help get us through this. Yeah, that's definitely, I I was about to ask you, like maybe in the end of the session as to, you know, what your thoughts were in the current COVID situation and in South Carolina specifically, are they right to reopen the businesses right now? Or did you have any opinion on that? Well, you know, I think uh, Mayor Benjamin and the city council have done an outstanding job. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, Governor McMaster has done a very good job. I noticed that Dr. Fauci, who I admire greatly, actually cited South Carolina and Governor McMaster, Governor McMaster's effort. And I thought uh, that was, um, I was very proud of balancing when to open and when not to and all of that. I I probably would side on the era of um, let's don't open too quickly because you have the health issues, of course, but then you, if you open too quickly and things don't work, you're going to be in a world of hurt. But I would uh, just compliment all the people that have been working on this and they've certainly done a, and what, what I think you find is you always have an initial, since we've never had one of these in any of our lifetimes, it, uh, it is going to be a little difficult to know exactly what to do at the beginning. But I think our local elected officials and state elected officials have done a magnificent job getting their arms around this. I totally agree there. Everyone who is on the front lines, the medical personnel and, you know, the police and everyone, they're, they're doing it. Even, even the people who are actually delivering groceries and all, they're they like putting their lives on stake. So 
I really do appreciate that side of it. No question about it. I just hope one day in the near future, I can go get a haircut. <laughs> you know, I was looking at a, at a funny joke where there are like two kids with full hair on their, on their face, covered. And then there's a person in the room and they say like, mom, you have to give us haircuts. <laughs> but it's actually, the, the, the guy says, it's actually, I'm dad. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> So yeah, so let's so after you were being a mayor, then you decided to step down. That was in 2010. Was there any reason why? I know like I saw like in interviews you had, you said, you know, it was your family you wanted to focus on. So is there anything which you decided like, okay, this was it? That's why well, 20, uh, you know, I think just think 20 years, then four years before that on Richland County Council, 20 years is a gracious plenty. It was just time. I had always been at Nexon Pruitt when I, got to about mid in the mid 80s I joined the firm so I'd always been a lawyer there so I've just been concentrating on that in the last 10 years okay and uh, so looking back at the 20 years what was the most cherished moment i mean you did mention about the convention center but anything else which you can think of which you would say like man that thing is is really good to remember uh, the thing I'm, i would be most proud of would be something that's sort of personal, which a radio commentator back then, they had folks who did a lot uh, of uh, hourly radio call-in shows and things of that nature. John Risley, who came up with the term Mayor Bob, uh, mm -hmm. which I think sort of symbolized being open and accessible and the guy next door. So nice. uh, that that's not a, an accomplishment uh, in, a, in a sense like the convention center, but I was very proud of that. That is, that is awesome. All right. So now you are, you are right now in Nexon Pro Ed. What kind of issues are you solving here? You know, doing legislative, but do a lot of local government work, do a lot of regulatory work and uh, certainly lobbying as part of it. Mm -hmm. Are you involved in actually writing out the bills? The legislative well, bills for your clients? You know, the bills certainly are written by the staff uh, over there, but you certainly have uh, comments on them and, suggestions if you're trying to get a particular bill enacted you certainly might draft that but it's uh, all you know, just part of it have an excellent staff uh, south carolina's legislature i think unlike others is not that partisan uh, people get along you know they have differences of opinion but most things are certainly very they work it out and i think more so than any other not any other state i'm not familiar with all the states but certainly a lot of states where you have these knockdown, drag out battles, we seem to get along better here. Governor McMaster certainly gets along with everyone. You know, he's a strong conservative. He, someone I knew and knew about him and worked with him because he lived in Columbia when I was mayor, certainly does today. Family always has been here. His father was a wonderful attorney, true Southern gentleman, as of course the, the governor is also. And, but I think we get along better here. So can you like walk me or my listeners through the process? So let's say a client comes to you and then they say, so we have, let's say there are already some bills introduced, right? So they say, you look at the bill and then say this may be impacting them, right? Their business. So they would suggest you some edits or changes. And that's when you talk to the staff people and figure out the legislators to see how you can amend it. Am I right? Is that the usual process? It is uh, most of the t of what we do is some entities just need to have a presence over there and monitor what's going on, bills that impact them. They need someone there. If they are government agencies, they need to, to know, follow the budget process. And then there, from time to time, are people who need a specific bill passed to help. And you have to, you know, work with the staff uh, over there and work with the various legislators that are in charge of it in certain terms of the committees. So. Uh, all of them are very easy to work with and very nice people. So now that you were you were a former mayor, so does the dynamic change when you're actually interacting with people now that you're an attorney and then you go back to the SM, do you have to still go back to the state house at some time or are you, are you primarily working at the Nixon Pruitt office? Oh no, uh, when the session is in before the COVID-19, we'd go over there every day they were in session. I think uh, being a former elected official it gives you an insight as to what the elected officials might be looking for. So for example, if you meet with them, I know from my experience as mayor, I wanted folks to 
get to what they needed sooner rather than later because you have a lot of meetings you have to be to. Also appreciate it when someone could kind of sum up what they needed, why they needed it. If there were problems in doing it, if you did enacted a certain bill, you knew you were going to get negative pushback to explain it and discuss it so you could sort of uh, know what's going on. I think the most important thing is you've got to be hot, uh, truthful when you give legislators information. You, you can only fool somebody one time mm -hmm. if you're a lobbyist. And how do you keep your clients engaged and informed? I think uh, through weekly reports and emails from the state house. So I usually email the clients, you know, a number of times a week during the session, mm -hmm. uh, send them articles uh, from the online newspapers and then a weekly uh, report. And do you, does your job involve a lot of reading of bills? Uh, yes, it, it, uh, every bill that's introduced, you have to determine, does any of them impact a uh, client? So you have to do all of that. Now you can read it by title. You actually have to read the entire bill and you have what is called a monitoring company that helps you with that. And wh how many clients do you have right now? Probably registered for at any one time between 10 and 15. And, and Nexon Pruitt has other lobbies other than yourself? Yes, we have a, another one here in uh, Columbia and a number in North Carolina. Oh, okay, got it. Okay, so I see, um, I think that's pretty much sums up all your career, your long established career. And, and I do see, I have a few general questions as well for you. And I do see that your emails, whenever I email you out in the night or in the morning, you're always there. So being the hardworking individual you are, what motivates and drives you? Well, I, I got good advice from my, from my uh, law school roommate, Lee LaVenis, who said, return every call every day. And when he gave me that advice, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have emails. But I found that if you will email somebody back, you don't have to give them the answer. You could just say, thanks, got it, own it, perfect. Uh -huh. And they know you're being responsive. Most of the time, unless you're asleep or taking a shower, mm -hmm. you're, you're sitting there with your iPhone. So being responsive is, in today's world, is very easy. When I first started out, you had to call somebody on the phone and you couldn't leave a, uh, you couldn't leave a message at, right. you know, most of the time back then or you had to write a letter and get someone to type it. Well, now you don't have to do any of that. And, right. uh, but if somebody emails you, you can immediately respond. If somebody calls you, call them back that day. Yeah. So you, you have to still tell me what motivates and drives you on a day-to-day -day basis. I think just uh, doing my job and doing it the best. Obviously, salary and money, you know, is a part of life. Uh, mm -hmm. Can't uh, deny that. But I enjoy being in the, uh, being a lobbyist, a lawyer, and lobbyist is is uh, almost like being mayor except you're not going to be on the front page of the newspaper every day <laughs> so you're dealing with the same kind of issues but not the same kind of scrutiny and do you miss that being a mayor i enjoyed every minute of it and i enjoy not uh, having to do it now you I, I noticed after I, I left office both the richland county and mayor you think oh my gosh what am i going to do i'm not this position yeah and about Two weeks later, you realize how relaxed you are because <laughs> you don't have to go to the meetings. You don't have to worry about things. Right. So, so, for example, if when I was mayor, if it started raining, I'd always worry about five points or other parts of North Columbia that flooded. Oh, um, yeah. While I still am concerned, it's not my job to make sure that, that true. it's taken care of. So a lot of things like that. Yeah, true. And if there was any one piece of advice you would like to give to either other lobbies, upcoming lobbies, or like any youngsters in general, what would it be? I think two things are, well, you'll be successful. And by successful is you'll go as far as your talent and the circumstances allow, but be truthful, i.e. by that I mean, give the good news, the bad news, whatever the news is, give it, make sure you give it. Mm -hmm. And two, be responsive. Most clients, get mad at lawyers. I'm sure lobbyists would fit in that category because they feel their attorney is not responsive and doesn't call them. If you are responsive, you solve a lot of problems and you learn a lot of things. I told someone as mayor, 
if somebody called me, if I called them back in two weeks and told them the answer to their problem is yes, they'd still be mad at you because you didn't call them for two weeks. If you called them in two minutes and told them, no, you couldn't help them, they accepted that. Right. Very true. Very true. That's a great piece of advice. And if you were not a lobbyist or like an attorney, what else would you be? If I'm not a politician, a lobbyist, or I would be a grandfather and, and probably retire. Oh, very cool. Very cool. And I think that's probably the next chapter of your life, right? Uh, well, that's been the chapter. We've got six children and nine grandchildren. So holy moly. Okay. So it's a lot of, that's a lot of kids. I understand. So your thanks, Thanksgiving is all packed, I believe. My wife does it all and always has, but uh, it's, uh, it's jam-packed as is Christmas. <laughs> that's fun. It's total fun. Well, I think that's all I had from my end, Bob. I really enjoyed this conversation. I know like I've looked at some of your conversations on YouTube. I enjoyed them, but I thought like I should dig more because I know there's more to it than what looks on paper. So that's why I wanted to have this conversation. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. Thank you. Enjoyed it. It was truly my honor to spend time with Mayor Bob and learn from his wisdom. Thanks for listening to the show. Please do send in your comments and questions you think I should ask my next guest. That is how together we can truly learn about the lobbying career. Your health and safety should be the number one priority during these turbulent times. So until next time, do take care of yourself and your family members.